I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Jose Feliciano, co-founder and managing partner of Clear Lake Capital Group. Clear Lake manages $75 billion in a flexible strategy across private equity, credit, and special situations in the technology, industrial, and consumer sectors. Our conversation covers Jose's background, operational experience, and launch of Clear Lake in 2006 to pursue a flexible strategy. We turn to the challenges and drawbacks of Clear Lake's flexible investment approach, its investment process, ownership model, and trajectory growing from $3 billion in assets after 10 years in business to $75 billion six years later. We close by discussing capital transactions for GPs, continuation funds, the current opportunity set, Clear Lake's investment in Chelsea Football Club, and permanent capital structures. Before we get going, Season 2 of Private Equity Deals kicks off this week. On Season 1, we covered eight recent deals conducted by some of the premier private equity firms. The show already has received accolades as the number one must-listen podcast for private equity dealmakers. Season's two theme shifts from sponsors you know to companies you know. The first episode releases this week. It's a discussion of Fenway Sports Group with Arctos Sports Partners founder Ian Charles and FSG's president and CEO, Sam Kennedy. FSG is a holding company that includes ownership stakes in the Boston Red Sox, Liverpool Football Club, Pittsburgh Penguins, and a host of related real estate and media assets. We'll announce each release on the Capital Allocators feed, but you'll have to subscribe to Private Equity Deals on your favorite podcast player to listen in. So this week, add private equity deals to your podcast roster and let the next 10 people you see know about the show. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Jose Feliciano. Jose, great to see you. Great seeing you. Why don't you take me back to your initial interest in the business world? I didn't grow up thinking that I was going to be an investor or a businessman for that matter. I actually thought I was going to be either a pilot or an engineer. And I went to school for mechanical and aerospace engineering. The inflection point was in my junior year at Princeton, I basically, my roommate, who was a year ahead of me, he actually went to work in Wall Street, went to work for Merrill Lynch. And that opened up a whole new world for me, a world that I didn't know existed. I didn't know what investment banking was. I didn't know what Wall Street was or finance, but it seemed like a terribly interesting job where he was getting paid to really learn about businesses. He would travel and if you were good at math, that was a plus. Seemed like a pretty interesting gig to me. Well, what'd you find when you got there? <laughs> well, in many respects, I think working in investment banking was a great foundation and a lot of the things that I just mentioned turned out to be true. Right? It's a great platform. It's just learn about business, learn about different businesses, I think to this day, I think it's one of the cool things about what I do is that you get to learn from experts who have been doing this all their lives and they're experts in their specific industry. The hours were pretty long and work was challenging in some respects. But in some respects, it was just, obviously, I also learned the, the tediousness of being an investment banking analyst, right? You know, the attention to detail. And I don't want to sound like one of those old guys that Life was always more difficult, but printing a presentation in color and then having to wait, you know, kind of 25 hours for copies to come out and things like that, it seemed much easier now. And so, where did that path take you from there? I actually spent three years of banking, and my time there was actually also interesting because I was working out of New York, doing a lot of work with Latin American companies, and this coincided with the Mexico currency crisis, which really put most of the region in crisis. I learned a lot about currencies and companies in distress, but also prompted my move to be mostly in U.S. deals. Uh, and that was great. Decided to go to business school. After that, I went to Stanford Business School in the late 90s. Great time to be at school. It was like you know, 
in hindsight, obviously, it was close to the peak of the bubble, <laughs> but it was one of those times in the world where anything and everything felt possible. There was a lot of excitement about changing the very premise of how industries were using the internet <laughs> and decided to, after business school, to join a internet startup.com. So that was a little bit of a left turn. And what did you find going from that experience looking, analyzing businesses as a banking analyst to working at a startup? And it's something that I actually apply to this day. On the one hand, investment banking is a great platform to learn about business, as I mentioned before. If you learn about business behind an Excel spreadsheet where in Excel, almost everything is possible. You want to increase margins? Sure, no problem. You want to grow... Uh, Revenue, you know, 5% or 10% or 15%, no problem. You can just change it. Working at a real business, it was eye-opening. The day-to-day of making banks work, everything from meeting revenue quotas to meeting payroll to managing your payables, all of those are very real things. And most, most importantly is people. You learn that business is really about people very much. Day-to-day of managing people, motivating people, compensating them, retaining them. That was in the, to me, a really important lesson. And it's an important lesson because many people in our industry and in the investing side have never really had a real job, never worked at a job where they're selling widgets, making, producing, marketing widgets. I think that, that gives you a very different perspective about investing. So to this day, one of the things that we do at Clear Lake is that our associates during their, their time here, they actually spend anywhere between three months, sometimes as much as six months, embedded within one of our portfolio companies kind of working very closely with the management teams there and really learning business. We're learning how business really runs, again, as opposed to what business looked like from behind the Excel spreadsheet. So you go in, dot-com bubble pops, and then what? Well, that was a tough time. So the internet company that I was working for, we had to go through a downsizing effort. So the first thing is that I learned a lot about the other side of this, what it means to be a company in trouble, be a company that is having to downsize, that is thinking about its very survival. What does it mean right now to really have to lay up people and have those conversations? So it was an incredible learning experience. The whole arc of that company was for me my second MBA. In many ways, a lot more personal. A lot, a lot of ways, lessons learned, cut a little bit deeper than anything else. It was a time to reevaluate, right? It was a few times in my career where I truly didn't have a job or anything to do the next morning. So I kind of reevaluated what I really wanted to do. What are the things that got me excited? And I came back to the idea of learning more about business, about different types of businesses and industries. But I wanted to do that in the seat of an investor. I really felt that there being an operator, if you will, there being a banker, I really felt that I wanted to Maybe combine the two, right? You'll be in the seat where I was not only doing the financial analysis and evaluating companies, but being part of the journey. And I finally found a job here in Los Angeles where I started to work for a small firm that did special situations, whatever that meant. <laughs> and that firm later became Tenement Capital and it later became a partner at that firm. So it was a great start of the journey or restart of the journey. But in many ways, it was a time for reevaluation reinventing myself, if you will, and really trying to figure out what I really wanted out of my career. When you stepped into that organization for the first time in an investment seat, how did the lessons you learned inform how you went about investing? Well, there were a few things. One is that I don't want to lose sight of the personal aspect of it. I just had basically gone probably what I'll characterize as one of my biggest failures in my career. But I had to pick up the pieces. And then to your point, try to basically find the best stuff and apply that to a new job. And I think what it meant for me is it was then the, what click, and again, it goes back to what we just were talking about, that yes, the financial analysis piece of what we were doing was really important, but to be a great investor, you needed to do more. And to this day, if you fast forward some of the things that we do at Clearly, we're sector focused. We have multiple sectors, but we're sector focused. And the reason for that is because we think that understanding a sector, an industry, understanding companies within that ecosystem inherently makes you a better investor. And I think that's what I learned a lot coming back into a financial world. But now with an investing hat on, I really felt strongly 
uh, to really understand these businesses, I needed to peel a few more layers of the onion than typical, at that point, special situations funded. And in many ways, that's the beginning or that's some of the foundation of Clear Lake and the sector-focused approach that we use here. So at what point in time at what became Tannenbaum did you decide it might be time for you to do your own thing? <laughs> so I was there for six years. And I think that entrepreneurial itch was always there, right? I think to be a great entrepreneur, but you have to have a mix of hopefully a real idea that is different, something that can be perhaps not even game-changing, but certainly a different way of approaching an existing problem. Over my time at Tenenbaum, one of the things that I noticed is that because we were more focused on special situations, there were times in the cycle that we were very busy and there were some really interesting opportunities. But there were other times in the economic cycle where those opportunities were maybe less plentiful. Similarly, you would look at traditional private equity firms and they went through the inverse of that cycle. Times where financing markets were open and doing LBOs was a great opportunity, but also times where there was not much to do because you know, the financing markets were not available and traditional private equity playbook was really not effective. And that was the second nugget of an idea. Having that entrepreneurial age, you kind of believe, if you will, sometimes irrational belief that you can do something better, something that other people have done many, many times, but you think you have a better idea, a better way to tackle that problem. Coupled with that observation, perhaps there was a better way to invest across an economic and credit cycle and do that consistently, particularly if you understood your ecosystem, you understood that industry, that sector extremely well. All of that coalesced in 2005, 2006, and really got us excited about at least exploring the idea of setting up our own firm. So with that investment strategy in mind, one of the first things you think about is how do you put those two together in a structure that manages liquidity needs because certain special situations investments can have a much shorter time horizon than traditional private equity? But the reality is that when we started the firm, we partnered with a larger firm called Reservoir Capital to start our firm. And the reality is that we actually didn't have the answer to that question. We fought a lot about the potential fund structures that would allow us to invest the way we wanted to invest. Ultimately, what we the, the eureka moment was, well, by and large, we're certainly very focused on owning companies that pointed to kind of more of a private equity locked up fund structure. And we needed the time, these were not investments that we were not, it was not a trading strategy. We were not investing today and selling tomorrow or in a week or two at a higher price. We needed the time to work with these businesses, turn them around in some cases, grow them significantly, make them better businesses. So again, all that pointed to a longer time frame, locked up capital. But then you have the question that, well, what happens are you investing in the secondary credit market? And there's some of these investments that have shorter duration. Actually, the multiple might be a little lower than the typical private equity investment target. What do you do? And the answer was simple in a way. The answer in some ways was staring at us in the face. And there were already a few precedents out there. But the short version is that it was recycled. When you look at our funds, additional funds with a 10-year lockup plus maybe a few extensions. The investment period is five or six years. But during that investment period, we can recycle any of the capital. What happens is that in a typical fund, about 25 to 40% of the capital gets invested twice. And that allows us to have the flexibility that we need to pursue traditional private equity or traditional buyouts when the time is right. But also, let's say in the summer of 2020, when COVID created significant dislocation, not only in our lives, but in the credit markets, we invested three or $4 billion in the secondary credit markets, basically in a period of three months. And we did that because we had the flexibility not only to invest, but if those investments came back very quickly, we were able to recycle that capital and really return in a value-enhancing, multiple-enhancing, IR-enhancing way for our LPs. As you were thinking about this different type of structure that felt better, how did you think about the skill sets required to invest across private equity, credit, special sets? At the time, our thought process was we were going to bring the best of the best practices of private equity, the best practice of special situations. The initial team had borrowed from that, right? Some people were a lot stronger in private equity. 
Some people had a lot more experience in special situations. Over time, I think our philosophy has evolved, obviously. And our perspective in terms of how to build a team is that we want to hire people at the earlier stages of their career, right? We want to hire uh, investment professionals at the associate level, maybe at the junior VP level. And over time, they get two things. They develop industry expertise, but also at the same time, you also become an expert in the full spectrum of the type of transactions that, that we tackle. So you're going to probably have done LBOs, more traditional buyouts, plus you probably have done three or four structured equity deals, plus you probably participated in several secondary market credit accumulations, and maybe a few the search for control deals. And that package we find is extremely valuable. Certainly is what makes as part of the clear like magic sauce. It definitely makes a clear like investment professional different, I think, than most of our peers in the industry. It also, by the way, makes it a little bit more difficult for us to hire somebody laterally. We actually have a difficult time going to a hedge fund and hiring somebody that does the stress very well laterally as a partner. We equally have a challenge when we go to a growth equity firm, somebody that understands to say, you know, healthcare extremely well, hiring that person laterally also is difficult for us because we find that they're lacking some of the skills that make for a well-rounded, clearly professional. I don't know if this works everywhere, but I know it works clearly. A lot of times you think about the benefits and drawbacks of generalists versus specialists. And here, it sounds like you have an interesting hybrid where you've got specialization over time in an industry, but then you have almost like a generalist sense of how to work with companies. Where have you found that to be both stronger than what you see on the outside? And then what some of the drawbacks of that? I think that the most powerful thing about it is that it allows an investment professional to spend all of their time in the sector that they have specialized in, but at the same time, really giving you that ability to step back, look at the ecosystem, look at what's going on in that industry and sector, and truly finding the best investment opportunities. When we look at the great investors in the world out there, most of them were not hampered by structure. If you think of you know, Warren Buffett, one of the key things about Warren Buffett's success is that he had a very flexible capital structure, very flexible source of capital. And within that, the same team, if you think about it, was making buyout decisions, was buying equity in the secondary market, was maybe doing structure equity deals in the midst of the financial crisis to save some big financial institution, and all the above, that full spectrum. And that's the type of investment professional we want to create. So in times like summer of 2020, where all of a sudden the world changes very, very quickly. When we went from the first week of March, where we were having investment committees weekly and talking about buyouts, two weeks later, there were no buyouts in our pipeline. We were having investment committee daily, and everything that we were looking at was in the secondary market. Very few people are blessed with that flexibility in the institutional investment world. The difficulty is that sometimes it's a strength and sometimes a weakness or it's an advantage and sometimes a disadvantage. Some people think that we are distressed investors. And then you may actually go down the street, you're in Midtown Manhattan, and go to a different bank, and they think that we are growth-oriented, tech-only investors. And if you go down the street now, we may be sports investors. I'm not really sure. So sometimes that's great because we're able to, again, tap all those as sources of potential transactions. But sometimes you would lose out in terms of people don't think somebody that may not be as well versed about who clearly is may actually not call us on a potential deal because they were not aware that we did X. And sometimes we get that. Now, maybe less so than 10 years ago, but I still sometimes get that, oh, gee, I will have called you, but I didn't know you guys did X or Y, Z. One of the other tricky aspects of people not being sure exactly what you stand for, of course, is capital formation. I'd love to hear how you went about building the business with a strategy that's a little broader than what a lot of other people would be doing at the time. Well, there again, the early days were difficult, particularly if you think about we were trying to raise capital at a really difficult time in the midst of the financial crisis. And it took us almost two years to raise that first fund. And part of the challenge was we had a strategy that was not plain vanilla private equity. 
we had to explain the strategy. We were not selling plain vanilla ice cream. We were selling vanilla with sprinkles and nuts and some other stuff in it. So we had to explain to people what we were doing. What I'm proud of is that at a time where it was very difficult for us to raise capital, at the time where we were not very well known, there were some things that you sacrificed. We actually gave a few of our big LPs in that fund a discounted or preferred economics. We had to compromise. But what we didn't compromise is that idea that we felt it was fundamental for our strategy to have that flexibility. And we were certainly tempted. We were certainly asked by kind of some of our potential LPs, well, we would invest if you restrict this part of your strategy to no more than 40% of the investments or no more than X. And we refused to do that, even at a time where we were desperate for capital, because we were convinced, and this is where the entrepreneurial itch or that belief, you are really reinventing or doing something a little bit different. We didn't compromise. We were adamant that we'd rather raise less capital, but have the flexibility we required. If you fast forward today, the great financial crisis really allowed a lot of institutional LPs to educate themselves in everything related to special situations and distress. So I felt that all of a sudden we became more mainstream post-financial crisis. Some of our original LPs that we had to educate and work with and hold hands with 17 years ago are still our same LPs. So by now, I think people understand what we do. I start every annual meeting with my LPs giving a brief synopsis about what is clearly and what is it that we're supposed to do with the capital that has been entrusted to us. And that's a really important component because a very significant part of the social contract around a private equity fund or any investment firm is doing what your LPs entrusted you to do, doing that consistently. And if there's any deviation or reason to deviate from that, letting them know why and explaining that very clearly. That is part and parcel of the relationship, I think, between the GP and LP. Now, after 17 years of annual meetings, you've gotten that pitch distilled. What is the message that you now deliver, particularly in one of these meetings over and over again? So the 30 seconds on Clear Lake is very simple. We invest in sectors that we know well, particularly tech and industrials, a little bit in the consumer space. We do that across an economic and credit cycle. We're able to do that because we do everything from a traditional buyout to turnarounds, carve-outs, all the way to distress. Yes, we're looking for value always, but most importantly, we're looking for companies that have a great potential for us to transform them into better and bigger businesses. And we do that through our operational framework called OPS. So at the end of the day, we buy companies in those sectors. We buy them through different entry points. We buy them at the best value we can. And we really make them bigger and better, and we sell them at a multiple what we bought them for. And we do that consistently. You, the LP, will be happy, and we, the GP, will be even happy. All right, so you definitely have that pitch nailed. <laughs> Let's dive in a little bit on some of the nuances. So the first is when you have that breadth of opportunity set within an industry or even across a company, how do you think about what the best investment means? In the early days, I would have told you, it's a sector that we know well, a company that we know well, and we like the valuation, check, let's go for it. Over time, we have learned that we need to answer a third question. And this is perhaps the most important question. What is it that our team can do with that business and with that in partnership with that management team that is different than whatever everybody else is thinking about, or at least more nuanced, or at least differentiated, to change the inflection point of the growth curve of that business What is that we're doing differently to make that a more valuable, more strategic, more interesting business? Not perhaps now, but in a year, two, five years. And that we have found is what makes the difference between a mediocre investment and a good to great investment. The better we are at identifying the two or three or four things that really matter in that business, and then making that change in those two or three or four things, we have found that the better the outcome. And then everything else is secondary. Is it better to invest in the economy or that sector is growing? Yes. Is it better to invest the valuations in that sector are going up? Yes. Is it better to invest at a time where capital markets are plentiful and you can leverage the business at a low rate with no covenants? Yes, 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 yes. But it all starts from what is it that you're doing different? So as you look at the universe of opportunities within the sectors you know, What's that process for sourcing the ideas? So it starts with the sector, right? 
Everybody else, we have a team of business development sourcing professionals that are talking to bankers, brokers, corporate development professionals. So that's what I would call private equity one-on-one type of source. We do that well. Because of our strategy, we have to talk to maybe different potential sources of deals, but different than traditional private equities. We'll also talk to turnaround professionals. We'll talk to restructuring lawyers. We'll talk to the distressed desk at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, etc. So our dialogue has to be broader dialogue than the typical strategy. Ultimately, though, we have to couple that with some thematic ideas. And we're not wedded to those themes, if you will, but we, from time to time, like to revisit things that where we have done well, or what is it that we are good at, and what is it that we're less good at. So, for example, some of our investments that you'll see a theme about cybersecurity. We have been in that theme for a few years now. Nothing too groundbreaking, but aspects of that within cybersecurity that are really interesting. Healthcare IT is something that we felt we have developed a great uh, platform. We have done very well in the auto aftermarket to take you to a very different place. So we have developed themes within our larger industry sectors that we think have allowed us to differentiate ourselves and exploit meaning trends within those larger uh, sectors. And then that goes back to how can we make that business better? We try to find companies where our skill set is particularly useful. In a typical year, we'll do 10 platforms, 10 investment platforms, but we'll do probably 40 to 50 add-ons. So companies or sectors where the buy and build approach is prevalent or effective, we love those sectors. So there's things like that. You can invest in, you got to wet your own competencies with both the opportunities out there, and then obviously try to create something that's differentiated as a result. When you're in an investment committee meeting talking about some of these ideas, what's that dialogue like in trading off different opportunities for limited amount of capital? Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes we'll get into that relative value game, if you will, but but we really try to analyze every opportunity on a standalone basis. And the most important things that we look at is the dialogue that we need to have here at ClearLink and that investment committee has to be brutally honest. So if you come to investment committee at ClearLink with a fancy deck and it's all upside and the injections go up and to the right and everything's great. You're probably going to come out a little bloody from that investment committee because invariably <laughs> there are no perfect investments. So we spent, I think appropriately so, more time thinking about, okay, what's the potential downside of an investment? What are the trends or what are the negatives that we need to overcome? Ultimately, what we want to come up with is a fairly succinct idea about what really matters in that business. And what really matters, you know, there are going to be a few of those things that are going to be positive, right? The business, the underlying market is growing significantly and demand is plentiful. This company has a competitive mode that allows us to have a great margin. It's that all those types of things are really important. Equally as important is what are the challenges? And then what is it that we're going to do? You know, what is it that we're going to do differently to make that a bigger and better business? And if you can say that, you can express that succinctly. I'm not a big believer of having these 200-page PowerPoint decks. A big believer more, I think it was Mark Twain that said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. So a long you know, PowerPoint presentation is just, you didn't have time to really digest kind of the information for the consumption of the committee. You got lazy and just put out every PowerPoint or every slide that you could. That's not the way I like to invest or evaluate businesses. Let's really look at what really matters and we can make a difference there, then you can fix a lot of other things later on. So once you own it, you mentioned your playbook, this OPS. Why don't you walk through what that means and how you deploy it? I will demystify it. It sounds fancy. And I think our lawyers have uh, even put a trademark on OPS, Operation of People's Strategy. But I think of it as very simply, it's what we used to do when we were smaller and the companies were a little smaller and there were the things that we used to do that flowed naturally. The lessons learned, the accumulated lessons learned over time that now we have tried to memorialize and we have to try to become more systematic about. That is OPS. And how we organize it is what we think are three significant elements of any business, operations, 
that may have to do with manufacturing efficiencies, it may have to do with supply chain, et cetera. People, which is a very significant aspect as we already discussed of any business. So it may be complementing the existing management team, bringing expertise that that team doesn't have, and then strategy, which may mean everything from M&A to just looking at strategic roadmap and product roadmap, understanding you know, kind of what do we need? Is it geography? Is it a, is some type of technology or expertise? So understanding that and working with the management team to enhance that piece of the business. But at the core, the way I think about OPS is very simple. These are kind of the lessons learned, the do's and don'ts that we have learned over the past 17 years and trying to memorialize them and institutionalize them so we can be systematic in the application. Hopefully a great investment and clear, like you're getting that consistency. That's what we offer day in, day out in every investment. So when you set out to do this strategy, somewhere along the way, I imagine you've had an investment that's like a marquee example of what you thought you'd be able to do that was a little bit different. What's that example? There are probably a couple that come to mind. I'll pick one, you know, it's in the, in the industrial space. You know, we partner with a business called Sage Automotive. Not the sexiest business in the world. They basically did automotive textiles. They have come tech as a carve out uh, out of a much larger platform. Really tough time during the financial crisis. What we identified there is the business had great management team, incredible capabilities, but limited reach geographically, or certainly a lot of opportunities geographically, and a great, essentially, distribution platform that could benefit from new technologies or new products. And in some respects, it was one of those investments that in hindsight, it looks easy. You bought it at a really attractive multiple. We partnered with the management team and we bought banks in Italy and Asia, and, and we did really innovative banks. The company had a joint venture in Asia where they didn't control it. And over time, we got to control that. And, and we did a lot of the blocking and tackling in that business. And then we actually sold it to a customer, actually customer slash supplier, and ended up making 10 times our money. And certainly a great outcome. But at the core, I think it was the best of clear lake in the sense that we identified an asset that you know, kind of people were not quite looking at it the way we were, and we were able to unlock that value or revenue potential. And a lot of the time, by the way, you know, we were just listening to management and then tried to apply or borrow the best ideas, and that's what we did. So you're going along running this business, and after a decade, you've got a nice business, call it $2, 3000000000 billion under management, things are going well. And then you fast forward six years and somehow you're at $75 billion in assets. So what was the inflection to go from a good middle market, flexible business to where you are today? Yeah, great question. Since history is uh, written by the victors, I'll give you my version of <laughs> what that meant for us. I think there were a few elements that have come together over the past five or, or six years. We spent the first probably five years in the firm cementing not only strategy, but team. And we did that at a time where there was a lot of changes in the world, going to the Great Financial Recession, et cetera. But it was actually a really difficult time <laughs> to grow up as a firm, a financial investment firm. Not to be used to cliche, but made us a lot stronger those first five years. The next five years then were about kind of demonstrating that to market, if you will, right? This is a long-term business. The reality is that oftentimes you don't know how good or bad you are until five, 10 years later. So really, it was the investments that we did in that 2010 to, I would say, that 2014 timeframe that, in hindsight, were great investments. They were investments like the one I just described in Sage. So I think in those second five years, if you will, clear like existence, we demonstrated that. We were able to apply all those lessons learned. Then you fast forward to year 10, and at that point, we had a demonstrated track record, a team that had been together now for, again, almost a decade, and relationship with our LPs that had also encompassed most of our life cycle. We had a really powerful combination. And at the same time, to be perfectly honest, it was an incredible time for private equity. I don't want to say never, but it was a time where fairly benign economic conditions, slow growth, but growth for a really extended period of time. You have really generous credit markets where credit was plentiful, really low rates, and fairly flexible credit. 
meaning not that much in terms of uh, covenants, et cetera. And equity valuations were sustaining a pretty sustained upward trend, particularly in some sectors. Some of those sectors happened to be the ones that we were experts in. So that was a magical combination where we were able to go back to our LPs, show them what we have been able to do for them, not in a theoretical basis, not in a mark-to-market basis, but distributions almost year in, year out. We were increasing distributions for our funds. So that took us down this path where we were able to scale our business at the same time that we were scaling our investment capabilities and doing that, demonstrating great results. And at the core, I think that's extremely important. We always go back to that. Every single conversation my, with my co-founder, Vedatic Bali, and I have with my other partners, starts and ends up, how is this going to make ClearLink better? Not for us, but for our LPs, because I still subscribe to, you know, what's like Goldman Sachs and analysts, you have our 14 principles. I think Goldman still has those. But one of them was like, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, was if you do the right things for your clients, in our case, our LPs, over the long term, that's going to benefit the firm, right? And we have subscribed to that. That has allowed us to scale in a way that for some has been surprising. We're a 17 year overnight success. <laughs> and what's different in your investment process managing 20 times the amount of money you were five, six years ago? Clearly, the companies are a little bit bigger, but in a way, parts of our job are easier now. Five, 10 years ago, nobody knew who Clearly was. Now, I think chances are that people in our world, you know who we are. We do fairly large transactions. That means that we pay a lot of fees to a lot of banks and stuff like that. So we get our calls returned a little faster now than we did <laughs> five years ago. So I think those are all positive things. The companies that we're partnering with, by and large, you know, have deeper benches, more sophisticated management teams. What we have found is that the type of change that we bring to the table is actually easier to implement now than it was five or 10 years ago with a smaller company. Not necessarily because these companies are embracing it any more or any less, but they have just a deeper bench and the ability to implement those changes maybe a little quicker than smaller companies. To be honest with you, the bigger challenge and the more interesting challenge in some respects, I'm not really sure if it's correlated necessarily with size, but it's people. We have had incredible consistency and very little turnover amongst our team. So, for example, one of my partners that I work with very closely, I hired him 16 years ago. It was the second job out of school. He was a baby back then, but it's 16 years later. You cannot grow as a firm. You cannot succeed as a firm if you're not allowing your people to grow, develop professionally over that time period. So clearly what he's doing now is very different than what he was doing 16 years ago. And we have a much bigger team. But for an entrepreneur, for somebody like me and my co-founder, that ultimately our first love is investing, sometimes stepping back a little bit and creating that room for others to grow and develop is difficult. What makes it easier is that we have been together for so long. So I know that in the case of my partner that I'm referring to, He's going to make the same decision pretty much that I'm going to make or that I, that I would have made 90% of the time. And we have the trust and we have built the rapport over time that that other 10% that might be in that gray line, we can talk about it. And that, I think, creates an environment where people feel like they're growing, they have enough autonomy, responsibility to make life interesting. But at the same time, we're not losing, we haven't lost whatever secret sauce, whatever magic sauce clearly had five, 10 years ago. I'd love to ask you a bit about some of the topical questions in the industry. One of the things that's interesting about clearly, like you started, as you mentioned, with the Reservoir of Seed Capital, you later did a recap. And then on the other side, on the LP side, you've done a lot in continuation funds. We'd love to talk about each of those. Having gone through the experience of having a seed investor, what were the positives? What were the drawbacks of doing that? So the first step in our journey was starting the firm. And for us, that meant how do we bring some of those elements that I talked about before, right? Sector expertise, ability to invest in present economic and credit cycle and operational expertise. How do you bring that all together as a startup firm? And very quickly, we determined, right, we were going to have to have a bigger team than most 
startup investment firms. And the best way of doing that was probably to partner with somebody. And that was difficult. As an entrepreneur, you have a little bit of an instinct of keeping 100% of everything. I oftentimes tell this to entrepreneurs in this business, much, much better. But we're a good example of that. To own 75 or 80% of your business and be able to grow that business and scale that business and make that meaningful and only 100% of, of nothing. So in our case, we partner with a firm that's fairly well known in the seeding world or was called Reservoir Capital, led by Dan Stern and Craig Huff. They provided some of that initial capital. Perhaps most importantly, having only one LP in that first fund allowed us to experiment. You look at that fund, quote unquote, it was set up as a fund, but it was almost an experiment to, you know, where we did everything that now we do, but under a much larger umbrella and different fund structures. We did a little bit of everything then. We did a couple of buyouts. We did a couple of disrupt for control deals. We did a couple of structure equity deals. We did a couple of rescue financings with warrants and things like that. So it was kind of a petri dish for us to experiment. Very few firms have that ability, their first fund to do that. Because if your first fund is an institutional fund, you are going to have a lot of pressure. Obviously, you have a great track record and be able to raise fund two and fund three, et cetera. We were afforded an incredible experience that for the first couple of years of the firm, we were able to do everything that we did with very little external impediment or structure, legal structure that would force us to do something or other. And by the time we went to raise our first institutional fund, then we had a much better idea of what is that we want to achieve with that fund and what part of the strategy we wanted to focus on. It was an incredible opportunity for us. So they were great for us. Obviously, they own a significant amount of economics. So for LPs in particular, the idea of outside investors in a private equity fund 20 years ago was actually not as well understood. And there was a little bit of resistance and a little pushback. To this day, there are LP segments of the LP world that don't love that idea, right? Don't love the idea. They look at it and they think, well, we think that that may misalign incentives some ways. And, and there's still some elements of the LP base out there that don't really love the idea of a minority investor in a private equity firm. But for us, it was an essential part of getting the business started. And so now there's the other side of it, which is there's a growing business in GP stakes. And you did a transaction like that as well. So why don't you walk through what you experienced in doing that and where you think it works? So our life cycle was we did the seed deal. Ten years later, we actually bought back that stake with the help of a structured deal. And then a few years later, we actually partnered with probably the two largest in the industry. We actually did a deal at the same time with Dial, Blue L Capital, and uh, Peter Sale, which is a division of Goldman Sachs. And for us, it was fairly simple. As we had grown, we actually had a fairly LP-friendly fund structure where a significant amount of our carry is in a European waterfall versus an American waterfall, meaning fund, we have to return the whole fund versus a deal-by-deal basis. So what that meant is that as we were ramping up the investments in our own funds, we were not getting that many distributions. And you do have to meet capital calls with cash. So there were two primary reasons for us to pursue a GP stakes deal. One was to create a base of permanent capital at the GP level that we could use to invest in our own funds. And the other thing is, we always had the idea, right? We were more than just another private equity firm that was going to raise fund one through whatever Roman numeral you wanted, we did think that there were some synergies and some benefits of creating what now we have, which is multiple products under one umbrella. And for us, that meant that we always had the idea of wanting to encompass everything from traditional private equity all the way to credit. Having that permanent capital also, we thought, would allow us to either buy or build something in the credit space which at that point, we had a hybrid fund that could do structure equity and debt with warrants and other things, but we actually didn't have a pure play credit arm at that point. We felt that strategically, that would fit in very well with our strategy, and this was a path to do that. We have gone through that whole life cycle, if you will. I think what we have found in general is that if you're good to your partners, you want to be good to you as well, right? Having that dialogue is important. Having transparency is important. 
I think we find in Dial and Peter Sill that they're always trying to help us, trying to make us better. Having a window to what others are doing, right? You know, one of the things that is difficult as a founder of a firm like this one is that there's no manual how to grow clear. Like there's no user manual, there's no growth manual, there's no strategy that you can follow. So really talking to other peers, understanding what others are doing, understanding what best practices might be, understanding what the right benchmarks are, that's invaluable. Those guys have been really helpful in helping us on that journey. So it's been a, a really good experience for us. On the LP side of the equation, you've done a lot with continuation funds. What have you seen works? The idea of continuation funds, that has been around for a really long time, pretty much since the beginning of the secondaries portion of our business, of the industry. We looked at it with a different lens. And, and the innovation that we introduced to the market, if you will, was this idea that you could do a single asset continuation vehicle. And, and just to summarize it super quickly, what you're talking about here is taking an existing investment in a fund and dropping it down into a new SPV, into a new vehicle, and bringing on new investors, creating essentially a new fund with a single asset. And there are obviously lots of instances probably more prevalent to have continuation vehicles that have multiple assets. And the way we looked at it is like, these were not, you know, traditionally people thought about continuation vehicles towards the end of a fund life. And oftentimes there were the assets, the companies that for whatever reason had taken longer to sell. In some cases, maybe because they were challenging, there was something going on in these companies that made it a little bit more difficult to realize an exit. We looked at it completely differently. We thought of continuation vehicles as a great vehicle for companies that were A plus assets that we wouldn't mind only for a long time, maybe forever, but certainly for a long time. And that for whatever reason, we felt that even though we may have realized a lot of value already for the funds, the next chapter in the growth curve of that business might require more capital. What we did then is go to our LPs and like we always do have a very transparent, very straightforward conversation. This is what we think this company needs. We will give you the LP the choice to continue with us in this journey. So you can cash out now and you'll know exactly at what price, or you can roll in. And when you roll into this vehicle, we're not only quote unquote buying or transferring the company from one vehicle to the other, but we're also going to provide significant additional capital for that company to be able to realize or crystallize the next chapter of growth or value creation in that business. And the good thing is that we have done five of them. Total capital, roughly just shy of $10 billion in, in those five vehicles. And the first two have already returned all the capital back to the new investors. I think we have seen and then an evolution about how our LPs are looking at these opportunities. You know, at the beginning, it was a little unusual and they were seeing, gee, but I don't have the ability to analyze this investment and this is different. I think by now, a lot of our LP base has realized, you know what? We have an existing relationship with ClearLake. We know this asset. Might as well reinvest and continue investing in an asset that you know well with a manager that you know well. And having that choice is fantastic, we think, for our LPs. And by the way, it's not binary. You can take some money off the table and reinvest the rest and multiple permutations about how you can do that. But we have found that, you know, particularly LPs that have sophisticated co-investment practices or co-investment efforts, they're getting increasingly comfortable with analyzing these type of single asset continuation vehicles and doing that. And for us, it's also a different version of these evergreen funds. I know there was a lot of talk in our industry about evergreen funds. Seems like that's an idea that is still trying to flourish. You know, it's been a little more difficult for LPs to really capture that. For us, this is a version of that. It may not be forever, but it gives a company another five to 10 years of runway. In a market environment like we're in today, where things are inflecting, there's conversation about whether existing private equity marks are good, about whether there's going to be a distress cycle. I'm really curious, when you have all these tools in your toolkit, how do you decide in a time like this where to push? Oftentimes, it's our biggest challenge as a firm. You want to have the widest funnel possible. Perfect world. You see every opportunity to invest that exists in the world. And then the challenge is how you narrow that really wide funnel to things that are actionable. Some of that attrition happens 
because of the circumstances in the market. We're at a point where clearly we are in the midst of a rising interest rate environment, so I haven't seen in a long time. There are generations of private equity investors and other types of investors that haven't seen that, period. And that's coupled with a period of high inflation, coupled with a period of uncertainty kind of in the sociopolitical environment, and coupled with a lot of uncertainty about whether or not there's going to be a recession. What I would say is that this is a time where you have to be careful. And in those times, you basically go back to fundamentals. Let's look at the best opportunities that we're finding in our sectors. Let's analyze those. And let's only invest in the things where we have very high conviction. Today, that probably means there's very little going on in the traditional bio world, primarily because of the lack of financing that really puts a damper on things. And people are not bringing businesses and traditional private equity options because why sell now? You don't have to. So our pipeline right now skews a little bit more into special situations. That may mean bespoke transactions where we are basically providing either some type of debt instrument or structure equity instrument to a company to enable something, liquidity and acquisition, something unique, or secondary market, primarily the stress opportunities that we think might be interesting. This is a time to be a little more selective, a little more picky, a little more to find that idiosyncratic risk that we love in the company, and then being aggressive when you find those opportunities. Our investment in Chelsea, in some ways, is a great example of that very unique, idiosyncratic opportunity where it probably wouldn't be an opportunity unless four or five things happen, but they happen, and they provided an incredible opportunity for us that we have taken advantage of. So I'd be remiss of me as a sports junkie not to ask you a little more about that. In that example, most of what you're doing is tech, industrial, there's a little bit of consumer. How does that come on to your radar? Sports is a fascinating world, and it has certainly now become maybe a more established, legitimate part of the investing world. When you think about the business of sports, it has a lot of analogs to other businesses, particularly actually tech-related businesses. A lot of the revenue in a traditional major sports league team is actually recurring revenue that's locked in. A lot of that revenue is media related. So a lot of these properties, if we don't think about them as such, they're really valuable, renewable content, essentially, that is consumed by a lot of the world. You look at the top 100 programs consumed or you'll watch in the US, I think the number is staggering. It's like 75 of them are NFL broadcast. So you have recurring revenue where a lot of the upside, a lot of the analysis revolves around monetizing content and using analytics, monetize that content. It's all about ROI and things like that. You look at the sports side of the world, sports world has been evolving. Baseball maybe being the best example of it, using technology analytics data to provide a better team, a better product on the field or on the pitch, as we would say in England for Chelsea. So when we looked at it from afar, 50,000 of you, a lot of the elements that we were seeing in some of our other businesses and some of our core sectors, particularly tech, were very similar to kind of the core competencies that today's sports business requires. And then that coupled with a very interesting situation in Chelsea led to the opportunity for us. Probably is worth spending 30 seconds on the background of the investment, the economic sanctions that the UK and the European Union put on certain individuals directly led to one of those individuals, former owner of Chelsea, having to put the team up for sale. So situationally, for us, Chelsea was essentially a forced auction by a forced seller, where, however, where a significant part of the traditional buyer universe for these type of assets was not allowed to bid. So if you were certainly a Russian billionaire, you probably were not getting a call from the bank. But even other perhaps natural buyers for the asset were not able to participate. It happened very quickly. So sanctions basically kicked in in February and by May, the real deadline of May 31st of last year to finish the transaction. So a lot of things that normally play against us in an asset like this, premium asset, where there would be, you only need one buyer to basically pay a really, really premium price to take us out of the running. Here, price was not the most important factor, speed, certainty, understanding of the situation, 
understanding how to turn a business around, perhaps, those were actually more important considerations. And that enables us to prevail. How do you think about applying your OPS to an investment like this? Once you own the business, what are the best practices that we can bring to the table in terms of operations, people, and strategy? In this case, obviously need to bring more people because it was a team because of the sanctions and other idiosyncratic reasons. It was not the best run operation that we had ever encountered. So we have been bringing in new talent. That's easy, but challenging. And it will take time to bring the type of talent that we want to the team in all areas, not only in the sporting side, but in the commercial side. It has meant how do we make the business more efficient? We have, again, an incredible team, an incredible fan supporter base. We want to provide the best possible product, the best possible team on the pitch. But that requires a lot of things. That requires a world-class recruiting effort. That requires a world-class data effort, analytics, et cetera. So we're trying to build all those things, albeit in a so far limited amount of time. And then strategy-wise, what are the things that we can do to make the team better, to make the club better? And we want to consider things outside of the box. Not that we're going to do all of them, but we want to think about enable one goal, which is hopefully to have a great team that continues to provide great results and excitement for a great fan base. Having a great product, great fans will allow us to have a great, great content that we can monetize from a media perspective. And then ultimately, we are betting also in the continued growth and expansion of the reach of the Premier League from a content media property perspective. And we think there's an incredible amount of upside for the English Premier League on that front. 500 to 800 million people per week watch the Premier League, and they watch the Premier League in 170 plus countries. That's amazing. I think we have a great product that has a great, great upside. I suspect at some point in time, you're going to have a long line of people waiting for that continuation fund asset too. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <but> <laughs> yeah. One last question before a couple of closing questions. You've been involved in a lot of interesting innovations and in structure. And I'm curious if there's anything that you're thinking about implementing or that you see in the market, either fund structure, business structure that you're working on currently. The most interesting trend out there that we have to think about is the different versions of permanent capital. And that can mean a lot of things. There's a version of permanent capital that could be partnering or doing something with an insurance company that has a permanent source of capital. It could be products or fund structures like BDCs or BRICs or variations of those products that are evergreen products. Or it could be going public, for example, at the managing company level. Those are all different variations, but it's, it's generally the same theme, permanent capital. And in our business, that is the holy grail, That's something that we certainly spend some time thinking about. I honestly can't say that we have decided to do any of those things or that we are pursuing any of those things in earnings. But those are the type of things that I go to bed at night. That's what I'm thinking about. All right, Jose, I want to ask you a couple of closing questions and then we'll wrap it up. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? <laughs> so in terms of the more somewhat active things, I do like to play golf. I'm a struggling golfer. And then on the more quiet times, I'm a geek. So I love anything related to sci-fi, Star Trek, Star Wars. What type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? Even though a lot of our investments nowadays are more growth-oriented, I still love turnarounds. I think they're probably some of the most challenging and intellectually stimulating types of investments where everything is possible. And as I always tell people, a great turnaround investment ultimately is a growth investment because there's no fun in stemming the bleeding. You first stabilize the patient and then you want to see it grow. You want to see that investment flourish. So, so I still at heart probably like turnarounds. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? If you were an investment committee, I clearly you would know that you showed me an upside case that includes a bunch of acquisitions that we haven't done, that have not been identified. You're going to be called out for it. It's okay to have a buy and build strategy. It's okay to have a buy and model that incorporates that. But if they're not incorporated, you better show me with M&A and without M&A. If you only show me the M&A case, 
of stuff that's not identified, just a fiction of your imagination, you're going to hear from me. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? My first partner at Goldman Sachs in the group that I was in, he was actually a fellow Puerto Rican. And I was really getting to know Wall Street. And really, that was a world that I didn't really understand. And a few times he pulled me aside and just gave me right advice. And I really appreciate that. And then the other person that I would say, even though he's a friend, in some ways a mentor, but not in the traditional sense, kind of like I'm calling him every week, asking for advice. But Robert Smith is a person that I've known for a long time. And as a fellow entrepreneur in this business, but also as a minority, he's African-American and Latino. He is somebody that from afar and sometimes close by, I've seen break different types of barriers. I think we all need role models like that. People that allow you to look up and say, gee, if he or she can do it, I can. And oftentimes, this is one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast with you is that I truly believe that there might be one day somebody listening to it. I may say, hey, that guy didn't sound that smart. That <laughs> but if he's that successful, maybe I can do it too. And providing that type of inspiration, I think is important. Yeah, that's great. What was the most challenging moment in your career? Well, one, obviously, when the dot com started that I worked that I worked on in the 1990s failed, that was difficult. But in some respects, 2009 was a really difficult year. We were still in the midst of trying to raise our first institutional fund. The markets were closed down. And there were times, particularly that first half of 09, where go home and look in the mirror and say, you know what, this may fail. We may not be around in a year or two. And that was difficult. After having absorbed one significant failure in your professional career, I think I had the grit and resiliency to do it again, but that had been really disappointing and hurtful. And luckily, we pulled through, but there were really difficult moments during the great financial crisis. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Many, many things, but I think perhaps the most important one relates to people. The most important and significant person that you're dealing with the same way that you would treat the person that cleans the floors or the serves the food or cleans the bathroom or whatever. Work is honorable and people are people and we all have our stories. I think treating people with respect that they deserve and and you never know. You never know that person that you touch, that you meet, that will someday do something great for you or will help you in some way. So I think it's that concept of treating people with respect. It doesn't matter who they are. Jose, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I think sometimes conflict is okay. I think sometimes you have to be able to deal with conflict and work through it. And that makes you stronger and makes the relationship stronger with whoever it is business, personal relationships, I think you got to embrace that. Some of that conflict comes because you have to be true to yourself in terms of avoiding or giving the easy answer. So I wish I had learned that to me. Jose, thanks so much for sharing this incredible journey you've been on. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you and thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.